Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Richard Bell. He's a filmmaker, he's a producer, he's a writer and a director, and he's, he's taken on a story, a Canadian story. Uh, I'm going to read the, the headline from back in the early 1900s, 11 Drown for survive when canoe capsizes war canoe from which 11 lads sank to their deaths in balsam lake and scenes at the at their ill starred camp you can search that online and find that news clipping uh old grainy black and white photos kind of tragic and creepy uh sort of creepy is not the right word for it but just unsettling is is much better in its in its own way and this is a beautiful film uh made by richard called brotherhood it's it's going to be on the super channel in uh, march uh i think of 2020 it's coming out you will be able to see it uh, everywhere and and it's a it's a film uh, uh, about a storm uh it's a it's a war film it's a film about boys it's a film about um, maturity and 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 about uh, how to I guess move out beyond the situations that we're in and 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 it's about choices and it's about responsibility and and Richard's very very um, convicted about about boys and manhood and what that means today in our culture and about how you know this is kind of a, a critique in its own way on 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 community and play and just the art of play the the importance of it and how Kids today, boys, you know, it sounds so nostalgic. Oh, kids today, they just don't get out and play enough. But the truth is we don't, all of us don't. You know, we're, 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 we're burdened by work and we're engaged in social media and we're disconnected from others in so many different ways. And so this is a film about, about uh, being antisocial and, 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 and not being antisocial, about stepping into community and, and, and what, what Richard would call uh, the boy crisis even. He, he, he talks about a nature deficit disorder something that you're going to want to hear more about and make sure you do uh, check out the film when you get a chance it's called brotherhood richard bell look for it wait for the interview coming up in a few moments here and don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and speaking you can get a copy of real changes incremental there if you'd like to do that face to face live.ca uh, we are crossing 500 interviews in 2020 it's amazing it's fascinating we've got things to do i want to build this we're going to be starting live conversations at the Oakville Center for the Performing Arts. Um, our first guest is going to be Emma Hansen. Uh, I'm going to be uh, hosting a conversation with her live and her new book still, uh, Daughter of Rick Hansen, actually. That's going to be April 2nd, 2020. There's going to be others, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, you can get behind Face to Face on Patreon and help us. Uh, you could support us uh, monthly, you know, if you so desire, and you're feeling, you know, somewhat uh, philanthropic these days. And if you can't do that, and I totally get it, if you could leave us a review, we sure would appreciate it on iTunes. Um, trying to get over a hundred reviews this year, um, it, it helps. Um, forward the, the the podcast to friends and family. Sign up for our newsletter, and if you want to advertise on Face to Face, you can do that as well. Please tell your friends and family about that too. We we have a platform, and it's a significant one, and it's growing. And we've got newsletters and website banner uh, potential, and we've got um, embedded ads in the podcasts themselves. So 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 reach out to us if you're looking to do that, and also don't forget Rabble.ca for a whole host of other writers and journalists and authors and thinkers and podcasters and bloggers and people there talking about, um, you know, news that matters, news uh, for the rest of us. So uh, stay tuned, though. Uh, Richard Bell coming up on a conversation about uh, his new film, Brotherhood. Richard Bell. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest here with us today. Uh, we have a writer and a director, a filmmaker with us here, uh, Richard Bell, to talk about his new film, Brotherhood. He's with uh, us here online on Face to Face. Uh, Richard, thanks thanks for taking the time today to chat about your new film. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. 
So first, first off, I, I, before we talk about Hollywood coming to the Quarthas, because I definitely want to talk about that, because I just thought that was wonderful I, that, that I read that online recently as, as I did a little bit of research about the film. First of all, congratulations on the film. And uh, what a, it's, a, it's a powerful uh, story. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, before, before I hit, hit the record button, I really, I really felt like I, I, I kind of stepped into the canoe. <laughs> yeah, wow, and, okay. And, and was... And, I and hope was you kind can of with, no. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I think I've actually fished Balsam Lake. So, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a, a part, part of the reason I would imagine why you got involved. I would think just the, the fact that so many people probably don't know about this story. So, so many questions to ask. But anyway, all that to say, beautiful film, tragic story, uh, and congrats. So thank, thanks for sharing. Thank you. That's And it's music to my ears when, you know, I... Uh, that that's a great compliment as you know a screenwriter and a director to obviously we want to make our uh, our characters and our heroes come to life and for you to know them and care about them so tell me more about about hollywood coming to the kuarthas what, what what was that actually like well we did a screening of brotherhood uh on july 20th of this year and it was exactly 93 years to the day that wow. the Brotherhood of St. Andrews set off across Balsam Lake uh, in their war canoe and were capsized by that summer storm. So uh, I worked in tandem with the Kirkfield Historical Society and Museum and also a gentleman um, by the name of Doug Patterson who lives on the lake and his family has had a cottage on Balsam Lake for generations. He contacted me through Facebook because he had heard that we had made this movie and it spoke to him. Um, in fact, for many years, he said that when he was a little kid uh, living on the lake, he would go to the tiny little church there in Kirkfield, and there was a plaque dedicated to the Brotherhood of St. Andrew on the wall. And he said that he wouldn't pay attention to the, what the priest was saying. He would just imagine what these boys were going through, what, ripping right. and clinging, clinging to this canoe on that night. So the fact that there was a movie made about the true story of their ordeal uh, really captured his imagination. So he was one of the co-organizers. Um, and he, he like paid for the actors like Brendan Fair to fly up from New Mexico and Brendan Fletcher and myself to fly from Vancouver. Uh, he put all the guys up uh, at cottages on, along the lake and um, we went out on a speedboat. But we found the spot of the accident um, and uh, Reverend Sharon Town, an Anglican minister in the area, she did a small mass for the boys and all the actors um, threw uh, flowers into the lake. It was very special. Uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the cottagers assembled at Long Point, which is where the Brotherhood of St. Andrew Camp was in 1926. Um, it's now like tennis courts. And, uh, wow. uh, you know, we, we talked and they asked me questions about the true story. There was one lady who came up to me and she said, I've lived on Boston Lake for 40 years and I never knew the story. Oh, isn't that wild? St. Andrew. Well, so I, would, I would imagine a lot of Canadians don't know this story. Some people do and some people don't. Like we screened the movie in Halliburton for their film festival there. And this lady came up to me and said, I learned to swim because of this story. My grandfather would tell me the story of the Brotherhood of St. Andrew and their canoeing accident and, to, and, and say it repeated again and again until I learned how to swim. So, and then there's other people who have never heard of it. You got you got to love a film, and I I, I, I sort of I was going to say I smiled out loud. How's that? Just created a new yeah. expression. But but I think they were at the they were at the train station, and the next stop Peterborough. Yeah. There's a little shot pretty, where um yeah pretty Brendan Fletcher who stars in the movie he walks past a sign that partly says Kirkfield, and I remember when it screened uh, I think it was in Halliburton and in Kirkfield like you get a little bit of a chuckle of recognition from the audience which is quite yeah lovely. yeah no it's it's quite it's quite lovely and to have it told so beautifully and such a such a canadian story with with really uh universal i, I was going to say universal appeal but universal sort of message and in, in meaning it seems to me which kind of is a nice segue i think into into that question around maybe maybe an existential question here for you richard you wanted to talk a little philosophy what 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 drew you to the story i mean i i mean i i certainly have my ideas and for me like any great film is about so much more than than what you're watching on screen it seems to me and yeah so, absolutely yeah, i'd love to, love to hear more about that from you 
Um, for me, it was all about the themes, the themes of <clears throat> survival, heroism, uh, boyhood, manhood, the transformation of the boy to the man. You know, um, one of the books I read was Iron John, which is the story of uh, you know, boyhood and manhood through myth. Uh, it's a very mythical setting where the movie takes place as well, you know. So um, I was drawn to the story because, you know, it's a survival story that's about the generation after the Great War. And right. it's a survival story about the boys who were sort of in modern times, the first generation that was raised without their fathers, or if their fathers returned from the war, they weren't the same person they were. Right. Um, so, and also it's just a story about a kind of dignity and selflessness sacrifice, you know, boys giving up their spot on the canoe. So the younger boys would have a chance of survival just a kind of dignity and uh, altruism, which I don't even know if it exists in this day and age, right? Of, you know, this social media kind of like obsessed kind of world and generation. And it's not a particular generation. It's all of us who are guilty of this. Just so self-focused. And this story from yesteryear, which is so about putting our tribe before ourself. So, so, so it becomes about community. It very much is a story about community. And, um, and it's interesting because when it uh, when it screened at Cinefest Sudbury in September, like their tagline for their festival is the People's Festival, mm, and I was like, nice. "Wow, this you know feels so fitting." Like I could, like it's so easy to you know write the press release for this because it's like, yeah, like brotherhood is you know it's a people's story. Or um, when it screened in Halliburton, their tagline was a community through film. I was like, "Wow, how appropriate is that?" Um, you, you made the comment about social media today and so on. You must have had a bit of fun with the line about about them all spending. Um, I forget whose line it was, but one of the one of the two leaders and spending all their time sitting in front of the radio. Yeah, I mean, I don't like things references that are too meta in films. I don't like right, being right. taken out, but it's just I couldn't resist that one. And <clears throat> oh, yeah. it's not Lovely. too meta, but because there was, you know, a very, you know, like the concern for the state of boyhood that we have now. Uh, or that I have now uh, and that, you know, scholars have right now and doctors and community leaders have that, that existed in the 1920s as well. And, you know, we worry about kids, you know, too much screen time and too much time on the Xbox. And, but I, you know, I think that happened in, I know that that happened in the 1920s as well. Uh, I think camps like the Brotherhood of St. Andrew were created and were nurtured uh, to get boys outside, to get them nature, to get them rubbing elbows with one another. Um, you know, Robert Butcher says, you know, risk builds character, and mm. Arthur Lamb encounters with challenge builds yeah, character. Challenge builds character. You know, yeah. I think that these two camp leaders have different, really different ways of educating boys. Uh, they're both right, and they could both be wrong. You know, like Arthur, uh, sorry, Robert is, you know, in many ways an architect of this tragedy um but uh, you know of course i think that what he was doing like uh getting those boys to paddle and head out across the lake and even just being at the camp was totally well intentioned yeah yeah i, I mean you had that scene with the axe and where where are they going and you, you know the, the the little uh the little fist fight that occurs during the little cross game and you're wondering what what's coming out of that and and, and doesn't arthur even or somebody questions him later about yeah, that was kind of a dangerous call to make. And yet, you know, you can see the character building in that, the, 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 the triumph of cutting, of chopping the tree down. Right. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but, but there's a, there's a self-awareness there that came out of that, that interaction between this young man, I was going to say boy, but this young man and this leader. Yeah. So I think Robert in that moment feels like <clears throat> Waller uh, played by Jake Manley needs to blow off some steam. And, and uh, Waller is sort of like the hotspur character in the story. And, you know, he's the rebel. He's like, you know, like the river Phoenix kind of guy. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, talks with his fists and he's, uh, you know, a very physical person and he needs to blow off steam. And he's representative of kind of like a hyper masculinity that uh, doesn't quite know what to do with itself. And that's why Robert, uh, who's played by Brendan Fair, 
you know, forces him to a tree and says, you know, pick on something bigger than you, like cut down this tree. So was there, I mean, obviously filmmaking, writing, uh, creating art of any kind, I think it's pretty, pretty intentional. I mean, we can talk, here, here, here's something, Phil, how about we talk about authorial intention? We can go down that path if you like, but, (laughs) but what, what interests me is, you know, the decisions that you made, obviously you've got a finite amount of time to tell the story and so on. And, 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 and you don't tell it other than a few lines in epilogue, we, we don't get what came sort of after and we certainly don't come get what we what what came before other than you know newspaper headlines 10 year anniversary battle of the Somme, um the lines like these boys don't have fathers Mm -hmm. you know so so we're getting some understanding of of where they're coming from we don't know really where they're going but i mean i mean again you know layers right ptsd survivor's guilt the trauma the the decisions and the choices these guys had to make in the moment that that talk about character right and risk it's 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 pretty layered so i mean yeah just wondering about some of those 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 thoughts that you had about as you built the story and as you filmed it you know again that classic how much did you leave on the editing room floor right or how much didn't make it into the film well, I would say nothing was left on the editing floor because um, so my, I had spent so long writing it mm. and I had so many really good story editors and <clears throat> story editors and writing coaches and mentors. You're just constantly trimming the fat, trim, 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 trim. And, you know, every I is dotted and every T is crossed and, um, you know, every character arc is charted and, uh, you know, there's been... I, there was just so many rewrites, you know, like when when in the screenplay, when I was writing it just by myself, like working with story editors, and then when producers come in, uh, on board, they have a fresh take. So I think, uh, you know, what was filmed was, you know, truly what was in the movie. Also, like, we didn't have a lot of time to shoot the movie. So, okay. you know... I, the, pr- the practical reality. The practical reality. And so I like to say I used, you know, I used the entire salmon making the meal. Um, I would say probably nothing was left on the cutting room floor. If anything, uh, more fat was trimmed and just to, you know, because there's, the, yeah, as the saying goes, there's the story you write, the story you shoot, and then the story that becomes the movie. Um, and with my editor uh, and I, we were just, you know, constantly polishing that diamond, polish that diamond, you know, like, because pacing is a hard thing to nail down as well, especially when mm. you're telling a story that's out of order. Uh, pacing the clip of the of the movie, um, there's you know I, you're you're just spinning a lot of plates. Is this is this an anti-war film? Huh, interesting. I don't think it's an anti-war film. I, I, if wow, you know there was a screening that we had for the producers. I remember, and the movie ended. And I looked at one of my producers and I said, I think we made a war movie without the war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I mean, I wrote. I, I make notes when I watch. You know, especially when I'm going to be interviewing somebody, or maybe think I'm going to be interviewing somebody, and I wrote down the word "the stupidity of war." Uh, yeah, and then I wrote beside it in brackets "madness." Like that, for some reason, that came out to me in the scenes, and maybe maybe it's the maybe it's a stylistic thing to some degree as well. And the well, I think the footage. The great, and, I think the Great know. War hangs over every scene in this movie mm, like a cloud, yeah. and uh, of course it would like. The 1920s were so informed by the Great War, you know, the entire, like, world over. And, you know, here we have a time period that we're looking at that sandwiched between two wars. Like, if we, you know, back up a little bit more. Um, I, 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 I love the fact that the, the Great War is in the, in the DNA of the movie. And, and, and I, think it's, I think it's important to look at this... You know, like Scott as Scott Fitzgerald said that the camp leaders were the lost generation. And Robert's not even quite sure what that means. And it's like, who were the lost generation? Like the lost generation are the people who died in the First World War and they were mm. lost? Or is the lost generation the people right. who came back from the war because their youth had been lost? Um, I don't think... And, that what, and, and, what, and what about their children? 
and then what about their and, what about I mean, their children whole, and this whole notion of transgenerational or intergenerational trauma now that we're talking about with indigenous uh, uh, folk in canada i mean just trauma in general well right? and trauma I mean, like global. you know i don't want to sound too magical but i mean there are scientific studies that prove that trauma is inherited so you know i don't know like the 20th century is a big century and I think it's really colored by those two wars that we had. I think that we feel the ripple effects of both of those wars every day, like whether we know it or not. Like, I don't think that you can have like a cataclysmic event like that and just not like feel it even just like in really, really small ways. So I, I just, when I was researching brotherhood, it was, it was a, yeah, this is what happened in, you know, on July 20th, 1926, but where are we coming from? You know, like what was the rest of the 1920s like in, in Ontario? And, and then what happened in the decade before? And you get a little glimpse of that, a little glimpse of that on the dock um, with, with the Wrigley's, the Wrigley's bit and the gum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true that kid well, that's, a, that's a steady that's a solid job was <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and and in that case uh wrigley's chewing gum kind of represents like a little bit of luxury sure, right like sure. um uh or having a cool job working at a candy factory uh, like mark's watch um <clears throat> that represents luxury as well i just screened the movies for a bunch of uh, middle schoolers at cineplex young dundas mm, nice and they're like, what's the reference of like this one character has a nice wristwatch? And I was like, that's like, you know, someone having like the iPhone 11 Pro. It's, um, you know, not everybody had a watch in the 1920s. So here's, so, so your script, your film, uh, your thinking, I would imagine. And, and um, d- d- does God sometimes use pain as a chisel? Great line. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I don't know where I got that line from. I think Robert might have actually said that, or I think the, I think the priest who conducted the funeral said something to that mm. effect. Um, canon Plumtree. It was a real canon, and the canon in my movie is kind of like a composite character. But um, yeah, like I mean, does I mean Robert is a religious man, so he says that. I mean you could say right. the universe, you know, chisels us. Um, I don't know. I'm always reminded of this uh, statue that I saw. I think it was at the Met in New York. It was like a billion years ago when I was in college. And it always caught my imagination because it was this sculpture of a man or of a young man uh, chiseling himself out of his own rock. Mm. So, like it was like a square piece of rock and this young man was being chiseled out of it. Right. And, and, uh, you know, that's something I can definitely relate to is like, you know, the man I want to be, like, who am I and who am I as a, you know, a son and a brother and a grandson and an uncle. And, and I think I'm always chiseling, you know, <laughs> screenwriters, we're always chiseling, you know, speaking of like removing the fat. Um, uh, yeah, we're big works in progress. And I definitely feel like that's how Robert felt about his boys, you know, about the brotherhood, like, he he was he was the chisel. Well, it's a it's a comment too to me about uh, about stepping into uh, stepping into your future, or we're sorry, stepping into your present, which obviously becomes your future. But this idea of intention and 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 choice, really, and isn't isn't this to some degree a film uh, about choice? And I think that's where uh, the the war the the war the implications of the the that that uh, other narrative or other narratives in the film. Um, uh, come out for me, you know, the choices that we make, this is, this is where we wind up as a result of X, Y, and Z. And boy, doesn't that tease out in the middle of a storm uh, on the middle of Balsam Lake. Yeah. And, um, you know, when it's like, what kind of person are we when we're under duress? Mm, Like, like, do, do we literally, do we sink or swim? So what do you know, I'm always fascinated, uh, especially around this type of a story. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty tragic story. What, what do you take away from it? You know, on reflection, watching it now, I don't know how many, how many times have you seen it? You know, a million. What, yeah, that's right. And at what point do you lose complete perspective in the editing process and so on, um, or at least some perspective, I suppose. 
uh, is it the film you wanted to make? Is it is it speaking to all the the, the, the you know the, the themes that you were hoping you know hearing the get it, you know with the with the middle school students and the Q and A and the interviews and so on? It's totally the film I wanted to make. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a hundred percent the film I wanted to make. It, it it like it was a lot of like you know blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, you know. Um, it, it it wasn't it wasn't easy. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, any filmmaker could say that. But um, and I do have some puncture wounds from the experience. But ultimately, the film is unscathed, and that's that is exactly what I set out to do. That's the film that I set out to write, and that's the story I I wanted to tell. Um, I'm so pleased with all the casting. I'm I'm super pleased with the score and the visual effects. Um, Everybody brought their A game and the movie has a look and feel that is the aesthetic that I definitely wanted. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased with the acting, the story. It's it, it, if, if I don't make another one, I could, I could live with that. I yeah, could, nice. I, that's I, nice. I could. Yeah. That's I a good could. place to be. Can you talk about those puncture wounds at all? Um, let's see. Hmm. I mean, maybe vaguely, uh, it's, I don't know, filmmaking is a contact sport. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. I've interviewed a lot of filmmakers over the last few years. I don't think I've ever heard somebody refer to it quite that way, but but I think I think point is taken. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, it's the agony and the ecstasy. Uh, yeah, no, I, I yeah, not enough said. How's that? Um, I am interested, though, you know, you talked early on and uh, right out of the gate, we talked about this idea of, of, of manhood and boyhood and so on. And, and it sounded to me like you, you, you know, this whole the boy to man um, conversation that's going on and, uh, you know, culturally and so on. Can, can you talk about that a bit more? I mean, it sounds kind of personal for you in a way and, and probably was, you know, a, 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 a strong theme for you as you were writing, I would imagine. And, 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 and watching these guys actually, te- it must be pretty crazy to watch actors tease out your words. Sorry, tease out, how about act out your words? It's It's got to be pretty weird. But but yeah, can you talk about that whole boyhood, um, the maturity, you know, um, a masculinity uh, conversation that you were Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> One of the books I read was called Real Boys, um, which is about the boy crisis, which is a, a term that was coined, I think, in the late 1990s um and you know this belief and scientific evidence that boys are like really quite adrift um and boys are not doing well in school um boys are becoming more antisocial and alone uh on like the very far end of the spectrum you could look at you you could look at like say you know what happened in columbine Mm. um and then also like even up to today, like, you know, incel culture or that tragedy with that man, you know, driving that van down Young Street, you know, that angry, apathetic, totally alone um, uh, male personality um, that if left unchecked, I don't, I mean, I guess it would just only get worse. Um, I think that as you, I, I don't, I I question whether or not people, I think people are really wondering how to raise boys today. Mm. And I think a a lot of the conversation uh, is about girls and, and females and, and that's great. And that's, you know, it's high time. Um, uh, But like a lot of the conversation right now is about the future being female. And what I'm curious to know is uh, what is the future for boys? And do you and do you have a sense of that? I mean, going well, you know, I mean, obviously you you want people to take away their you know filmmaking art isn't great art about your own interpretation, what you bring to the table, context where you were at at the time when you saw the film, and 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 don't you? I would think too, a story like this I think has the ability to sit with people, and 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 hopefully gets planted in fertile soil, right? I mean, is yeah. that, isn't that part of what? the hope so is of a filmmaker you know for their conversation dialogue people people going a little deeper absolutely i i i'm concerned about the state of boyhood and i have been for for 10 years i think that 
in the past, like even like when I was growing up, like I was in, you know, Beavers, Cubs, Scouts, um, you know, they were initiations. They were more, they seem to be more rites of passage. And I think that rites of passage need to happen in the real world um, and not like getting to a next level on a video game. Um, I can understand why boys are attracted to video games in the sense that um, boys tend to like that feeling of accomplishment. But we also have a problem in the sense that we really need to, I mean, and it's not just boys, uh, kids need to get back into nature. Hmm. And uh, like another book I read was Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. And that's, you know, I think he wrote that in the late 90s, <clears throat> early 2000s. And that's about nature deficit disorder. Um, hmm. And, you know, you feel it and you see it a lot in cities. Uh, of course, um, you know, kids in the country are, probably they don't have this problem as badly but i i I feel like i feel like boys need to uh return to nature and that they need to like play on the monkey bars and they need to fall down and you know kind of skin their knee and 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 that's what robert felt like that's what that's why those boys are at that camp that's why they're going on that canoe across the lake um and, you know, that's that's a modern concern about the boy crisis, but, you know, it also existed in the 1920s. And, um, you know, like uh, Lord Baden-Powell started the Cub Scouts, I think it was a, in 1912, right? And and it was his goal to, to get boys out in the wilderness. Um, the modern Olympics was founded, you know, uh, around that time as well to promote athleticism. Uh, so... I think, you know, I think as, you know, as things change, they remain the same, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I do, I, I do, I do hope in that there's like, there's a future for boys that involve like that good sweet spot of masculinity, which is, you know, the, the manly mannered middle ground. Um, you know, obviously like, you know, we have an example in the White House of what toxic masculinity is, right? Um I also see and hear a lot of reports about boys getting punished for boy-like behavior, uh, which is something that we need to have a conversation about as well. It sounds, it almost sounds to me, you know, we're kind of, kind of back to community a little bit. I mean, isn't that sort of what you're selling? I mean, community, I suppose, for, for men and for boys, for young men. Um, the line, uh, I think it was Robert's line, because they both, they both, Arthur and Robert fought in the war, right? Yes. Um, but but the line, I fought for those uh, in, in front of me, behind me, sort of beside me, like in yeah. other words, you, honestly, so I grew up in a, in a, 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 a Christian environment, and, the, and the, the phrase that that came to my mind was, you know, that New Testament line, greater love hath no man than this, you know, laying, laying his life down for his friends. Yeah, and, and that line that really, was- really came i don't know if you had that in mind when you were writing the film but boy you know it just especially when they were out on the canoe and and this whole idea of bravery and choice and what and how do you actually behave when you're in the middle of it and and you're probably not going to get that from playing video games no hanging out on your own you're going to get it by you know falling down in the dirt chopping some trees down these can be metaphors too playing lacrosse together right you know how many how many in the canoe were there 15 or 16 Right. Yeah, like uh, something like that. In the movie, we have less. Um, I had to take some license. Um, mm. But the, um, I, I don't believe that, uh, like I was never a physical uh, kid. I was not in team sports. Right. Um, I wasn't a super masculine kid uh, or masculine teenager. Um, so I'm not saying that boys need to be like forced into situations right, where they're right. uncomfortable, like right, you know, right. go join a soccer team or go chop down a tree. Well, um, real men join the military, don't they? Isn't yeah, no, right? I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> and, and like, so, so and I hated team sports and, and my, like, if I was like misbehaving, my parents would be like, we're going to enroll you in soccer. And I was like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> That's a pretty funny form of punishment. Yeah. Whereas my older brother, <clears throat> uh, who's flying in tonight to see the movie tomorrow, he, he loved all that stuff. Right. Like, so I'm not saying that there's one kind of masculinity or one mm-hmm. correct mm-hmm. kind. And in many ways, like all the, all the characters in the movie are archetypes for masculinity, sure. different kinds, the varied kinds. Uh, and I had a lot of fun with that. And that's 
probably and hopefully why some of the characters or the char- you felt like you knew them, right? Because they kind of remind us of someone. Mm. And the thing that's really interesting about when people see the movie and they kind of compliment me on one of the characters, I usually find that the character that they compliment me on is the character who they're sort of like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, so, and I, I'm probably like a cross between Will and Leonard because I'm a bit of a nerd and uh, perpetually the younger brother. Um, anyway, so I'm not saying that like, like they have to be forced into like uncomfortable situations, but, but I do feel, I do feel a little worried about people pampering their kids these days. Um, you know, both my brother and my sister-in-law are um, high school teachers and they see it all the time. They're like, Oh, like, you know, they're not, the kid's not paying attention. It's because their mom is texting them, uh, you know, from home. And it's just like, right. uh, okay. I, I don't want to be all back in my day, but like back in my day at Terry Fox senior secondary in Port Coquitlam, there was one pay phone and no one ever had a quarter. And, you know, we weren't, if there was an emergency, like a mom or dad would call the school and you'd get called to the principal office. And it was, I, I just feel, I feel like we're kind of creating um, uh, the adults today or the parents today might be creating a, creating a, a lot of anxiety. Hmm. Im- imp- imposed anxiety. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, you, we could talk about helicopter parenting or right, over parenting right. or putting your kids in bubble wrap. Um, you know, what happened to the era of like, you know, be home by the time the street lamps well, come on? Well, well, how about and how about the back to risk and challenge both build character? And they do. Right. So so you, you're going to have to like maybe land the helicopter and, and, and let them go. Right. I mean, obviously, there's wisdom that comes into play here and so on as well as a parent. I have a 12 and a 14 year old. I'm sure one day they're going to listen to a few of my podcasts and go, Dad, boy, you sure talked about us a whole lot. Um, but, <laughs> Are they uh, boys? Spencer and uh, Victoria, boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. OK, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, those, you know, taking those risks and saying, okay, well, maybe they are now old enough to do that or they can join that team. Or they well, and we're also in the era of everyone getting a ribbon. Right. And when I was, right. yes. when I was in elementary school, like we had sports day and, you know, it was blue, white, and red and everybody wanted to get the blue ribbon. And we had first place, second place and third place. When I was in Cubs, we had like, you know, community runs, like you, you'd want to win it, you know, like, um, it's, it, 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 it's kind of gone out the window and now everybody gets a ribbon. And then when everybody gets a ribbon, it just sort of feels meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of, everyone gets one and sort of, therefore no one really. Therefore it means nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Sad, sadly, Richard, we're going to wrap it up in a couple of minutes, but I, I did want to, it's, you know, what's I, what I love about your film, and I hope this is, sounds the way I mean it to sound, it, it's a, such a Canadian film, but it, 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 it doesn't really feel Canadian. Does that mean like there's a real universal edge to it? It's, 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 and, and again, congrats on it, but, but, but um, I love how you brought in the, uh, the land of the silver birch comes back a few times. Yeah. And I just kind of wondered if that was your, your, <laughs> you know, Hollywood comes to the Corthus. So, you know, <laughs> well, your, it's your, funny your you ode to Canada. Land yeah. of the Silver Birch, because <clears throat> as a British Columbian, as a Vancouverite, I had never heard that song before. Mm. So, and I know that that song, it's quite the earworm. And when people, when people see the movie, they kind of walk out singing that song. Oh, I had yeah, totally. never heard that song before. When I, on the West Coast, like being in Cubs, it, like we sang a song that went, King Gang, Gooly, 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 Watcha, King Gang, Goo. Like that was the song that we sang. Um, I, like, but, um, it, and I had written, like, um, I had found another song for the boys to sing in the canoe, but we hired a, we hired a music coach and a singing coach uh, on location where we shot. And she said, you know, like this song is like the anthem of youth. Oh, like, it's absolutely perfect. It's for absolutely boys and girls. Yeah, and yeah. me, you know, Vancouver, I like, we don't have, like, I feel like I'm in Canada when I come to Ontario. Vancouver is mm-hmm. like a different, Vancouver is like a bit of a different animal. And we don't really have a cottage culture. We have more like a cabin culture. Right, right. Uh, you know, and the skiing and all that kind of stuff. But that's a great song. And uh, yeah, man, when the cast starts singing it and they're all together, 
uh, like it just stays with you for a couple of days. Well, I'm pretty sure I've sung it in a canoe. I mean, I did, I did, uh, I did boys camp for years. And so there were, there was a lot of beautiful memories and moments for me in this film. I mean, again, it's a tragic story, but a, a, a beautiful film. And I love, yeah, I love, it's interesting. I didn't know that. I thought it was kind of a Canadian song. Um, but, um, but well, yeah, I mean, it is Canadian, but I think, it is. I, yeah. think it, I think it's like, if we're to zero it in, I think it's, or maybe I'm just clueless, but like, <laughs> well, right. I'm going to the wrong camps. We could um, we could go with the clueless. Uh, yeah, for yeah. Sure. yeah I'm um, happy with that. But I think I think it's it's very Ontario. I think it's it's very Ontario, and and it's so funny when you talk about the movie or when people see the movie, and you know we've shown it at Kirkfield and Balsam Lake, and at uh, at Cinefest Sudbury, and in Halliburton, uh, in the smaller towns and the rural communities, and I really hope that there are more. There are more. Uh, people's mm. eyes just sparkle. Like everybody's got a summer mm. camp story, mm. right? Yeah. And oh, for sure. And this film isn't all tragedy. I mean, I, I'd like to think that there's lots of buoyant, happy moments, moments of nostalgia, moments of whimsy and charm. And uh, the movie really is about the darkness and the light. Oh, and absolutely. I, it's about, and for me, uh, it was about, really about being present as well, which I think is. It's been my challenge. Uh, friends and family would tell you, you know, it's it, connecting the head and the heart and, and, and staying in the moment. And and, and I don't know, I, it, brotherhood for me was a beautiful, beautiful reminder of that. Wow. Thank you. Well, I, I know that there's a, a bit of death in it, but as I like to say to people, I think a story about death is ultimately a story about life. Mm. Nice. Well, that's um. I think that's a pretty nice way to 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 end the interview. Sadly, that's a nice anyway. button. <laughs> yeah. So so quick quick plug. The film's going to be out uh, for everyone to see uh, uh, globally, I guess, uh, in the not so distant future, somewhere in 2020 on on um, Super Channel and iTunes, I believe. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, can I mention the theatrical run or absolutely? Yeah. yeah. Really, it, I don't know when we're broadcasting, but it opens on Friday, December six. There's four screenings a day, so there's two matinees uh, and two evening screenings. Uh, we uh, would love to have people there the first weekend because if it you know plays for the first weekend well, it'll open in other cities, but it'll stay until about December 12th uh, at Cineplex, Young, and Dundas. And then it opens in Sudbury on Friday, December 13th at the Indie Cinema uh, in Sudbury. Nice. Nice. Well, what a pleasure chatting with you today, Richard. Thanks again for the for this uh, this film and for taking the time to tell a, an important story, a, an important Canadian story that that's clearly universal on on so many levels. And 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 uh, yeah, and again, congratulations. We've been we've been talking uh, with Richard Bell here today about his new film, uh, Brotherhood. Thanks so much uh, for your time today. Thank you so much, Dave.